Boa tarde a todos, mais uma vez. Eu chamo-me Gonçalo Marcelo e faço parte do Seminário de Jovens Cientistas da Academia das Ciências de Lisboa. Esta é a terceira sessão do nosso ciclo de conferências Como Dialogar com Quem Não Quer Ouvir, para lá da polarização e da desinformação, que, como saberão as pessoas que já assistiram às sessões precedentes, é um, um ciclo que visa basicamente responder a, às perguntas do próprio título, isto é, em sociedades profundamente divididas uh, como as nossas, que estratégias é que nós temos para conseguir falar com sucesso com pessoas que têm crenças completamente diferentes das nossas e que muitas vezes se podem pura e simplesmente recusar a comunicar. Nas primeiras sessões tratámos, na primeira, da questão da polarização política e do populismo, com o professor Renato Chanin Ribeiro, e, e na segunda sessão uh, tratámos das questões da, da pseudociência e da desinformação, com o professor Carlos Fiolhais e com o David Marçal. E é por isso agora um, um grande prazer termos uh, uma contribuição uh, diferente, desta vez com o professor Richard Carney, um, do Boston College, uh, uma comunicação intitulada, uh, dizendo primeiro em português, uh, Diálogo Difícil e Partilha de Histórias, o Guestbook Project. Ora, o professor Richard Carney é professor de filosofia no Boston College e diretor internacional deste projeto, o Guestbook Project, Hosting the Stranger Between Hostility and Hospitality. É também membro da Academia Real da Irlanda tem um, um percurso um, eclético, muito rico, tendo começado a fazer a licenciatura um, em Dublin, depois o mestrado na Universidade de McGill, no Canadá, e o doutoramento na Universidade de Paris 10, uh, Nanterre, onde trabalhou com os filósofos uh, Paul Ricard, que teve uma grande influência na sua, na sua formação, e uh, Levinas. Uh, tem um percurso que passa não só pela filosofia, nomeadamente pela filosofia da imaginação, uh, à qual se dedica um, de forma privilegiada, mas tem também uma grande intervenção cívica enquanto intelectual público, nomeadamente nas questões da hospitalidade, da qual o Guestbook Project é um exemplo, e, e também uh, do diálogo interreligioso. E para dar apenas uma pequena, um, uma pequena noção da, da importância das suas intervenções também cívicas e, e políticas, um, teve um papel, desempenhou um papel importante em, em escrever algumas das propostas para um acordo de paz na Irlanda, quando trabalhou com a primeira-ministra à época, a Mary Robinson. Um, tem mais de 20 livros, vou apenas mencionar um dos, do qual vai provavelmente uh, falar, que é um livro recente, chamado Radical Hospitality from Thought to Action, publicado em 2021 pela Fordham University Press e escrito em colaboração com Melissa Fitzpatrick. Um, vou agora, basicamente... Um, Mudar, esta sessão vai decorrer em inglês, como já se aperceberam, não tem tradução simultânea. Vou então uh, dar as boas-vindas ao professor Richard Carney, reforçando também as boas-vindas a todos os participantes e agradecendo a vossa presença. Um, e, e introduzindo o professor Richard Carney em, em inglês, uh, passar-lhe depois imediatamente a palavra. Uh, So thank you, Richard, uh, for being with us um, today. As uh, I, I just told in, in Portuguese, this is uh, the third conference of the conference cycle, how to dialogue with, with those who refuse to listen beyond uh, polarization and disinformation, which for our international audience is, is a conference cycle promoted by the Young Scientist Seminar um, from the Lisbon Academy of Sciences, um, to which I belong, uh, along with other colleagues. Um, so, um, Professor Carney is a professor of philosophy at Boston College and the international director of the Guest Book Project, as I told in Portuguese. He's the author of over uh, 20 books uh, in European philosophy, um, also dealing with philosophy of imagination, questions of hospitality, interreligious dialogue, and is also a public intellectual um, who, has, uh, who has made important contributions um, for the, the topics of Irish 
post-national uh, identity, for instance, uh, the questions of radical hospitality, of which the book uh, Radical Hospitality from Thought to Action, published in 2021 by Fordham University Press with Melissa Fitzpatrick, is a notable example, and he's also the director of the Guest Book Project. So without further delay, uh, Richard, again, thank you very much for being here with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzale, Gonzalez. Um, Gonzalo and uh, your colleagues, a great pleasure and an honor to be here. And I wish I could speak to you all in Portuguese, but alas, um, there are limits to my linguistic abilities. So I will settle for English, which isn't my national language, but the one I speak most <laughs> easily and readily. Um, so there we are. Anyway, I would like to talk about the possibility and impossibility of dialogue with the adversary, the, the other, uh, the enemy. Um, in terms of sort of two main models. On the one hand, the model of an exchange of narratives. Uh, if someone asks you who you are, as Hannah Arendt once put it, you tell your story. So our, our identities, be they personal or communal, are basically narrative. And so when faced with the possibility of trying to understand another human being, particularly one who does not readily volunteer uh, an immediate transparent consciousness or presence, uh, one is, I think, almost compelled to resort to the model of what is your story? If you don't want to talk to me, fine, but what is your story? Let me try to understand you. So that's a beginning, an and that may lead ultimately to an exchange of stories, where if, where, where if you listen to the enemy, and you offer the enemy an opportunity to tell their story, they may then be more inclined to listen to yours. This involves a, a, a second process, and this brings me to the second model, which is that of translation. Uh, translation as an ethic of hospitality, where one is a host to a guest. And the word for guest in most Indo-European languages, uh, including English coming from the Anglo-Saxon, gast, uh, can mean somebody ghastly, <laughs> as, as, as in aghast, um, uh, i.e. somebody who strikes one as, 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 as untranslatable, as very often monstrous, certainly as um, aggressive. So there's that, that intonation in ghast, the ghastly, uh, being aghast uh, when faced with another person, but there's also the guest. So we have that double meaning, not just in English, the guest and the, the guest, but also, as I say, in most other Indo-European languages, hostis in English, sorry, in Latin, uh, is the root of both hospitality and hostility. And hostis, as Emile Benveniste pointed out in his very influential book um, on Indo-European science and language, um, is, uh, carries this double meaning of both guest and enemy from its beginnings. You find the same in, in Greek, leaning either to xenophobia or xenophilia, uh, and uh, other languages likewise. So faced with this basic ambiguity in one's approach to the guest, the other, as potential friend or enemy, there is an ambiguity built into the translation process. Because any dialogue is a translation with somebody who appears to you and who you translate into your terms, into your host language. Um, but there's also a, a guest in the guest language that is lost in translation, that refuses to be translated. And this accounts for what Walter Benjamin called a kernel of untranslatability. Now that's built into the process of dialogue at the best of times, there's always in an exchange of words or an exchange of narratives in which our words are embedded, certainly when it comes to our identities, there is this call for translation. But translation has to serve two masters, as Paul Ricoeur puts it, the language of the host into which you are welcoming your, your enemy um, and your stranger and the language of the guest, which you are trying to understand, while always acknowledging there will never be a perfect translation. We live after Babel. We live in a word of Babel. Uh, 
And that means multiple languages of polyglot. And every attempt to overcome that, be it Leibniz, be it Latin, when the Roman Empire imposed itself on the world, or Greek before that, or English in our own day, or French during the Napoleonic uh, Empire, vernacular languages have tried to impose a universal language, a lingua franca, on multiple different um, communities, linguistic communities. Um, and then we had the experiment with Leibniz of a characteristica universalis, a sort of an artificial uh, symbolic uh, language, of which, by the way, our contemporary model of symbolic logic is a sort of a, a, a distant infant. Um, but as we know, that's not adequate when it comes to actually commu communicating with people, when it comes to issues of conflict. And language always involves a conflict of interpretation, because there is no such thing as language. There are only languages. As Ricoeur puts, il n'y a pas de langue, il n'y a que des langages. And so we are committed and condemned to this conflict of, of interpretations, of narratives, um, of identities. So that's really what I want to begin with. Uh, and it goes back to an old hermeneutic principle uh, in the 19th century, alles Verstandes ist Missverstandes, that every form of understanding involves a misunderstanding. James Joyce, we're celebrating his, the centenary of Ulysses, his great novel uh, this year, um, 2022, but he had a great description of Dublin, the Dublin who he, which he was trying to translate, as it were, in his literary masterpiece, Ulysses. He called it a city of intermisunderstanding minds. And it's not just Dublin, it's not just Ireland, it's not just Europe, it's, it's the world. Uh, we live in a world of intermisunderstanding minds. So from the word go, there are those who would say dialogue is impossible. Um, you have a host of philosophers, uh, contemporary continental philosophers who would argue something pretty similar to that. Levinas who would say the other, the stranger is always transcendent of whatever particular set of categories and, and suppositions and presuppositions we bring to a discussion. Uh, there's always something vertical, transcendent, irreducible that resists us, that uh, withdraws from the, the other that manifests itself to us. There's another that conceals itself, that withdraws. Even if the other doesn't wish to withdraw, um, there's the consciousness and there's the unconscious. Even to ourselves, we are strangers. There's a, a, an untranslatable kernel in our dialogue with ourselves. Plato said the highest form of an aim of philosophy was the silent dialogue of the soul with itself. Know thyself, Socrates said. But even in that process of self-knowledge, self-understanding, there is also something lost in translation. We are strangers to ourselves, as Julia Kristeva puts it quite correctly. So acknowledging from the beginning that all dialogue is, at least for some philosophers, impossible. Uh, Derrida would agree with Levinas on this. Um, you know, translation is impossible. Recur and various other hermeneutic thinkers, myself included, would, would try to shift that a little bit and say, well, it seems impossible at the outset, because you can never have, we all admit, a pure adequation between two transparent consciousnesses. That does not exist. All our words and language are mediated through narrative symbols, metaphors, myths, opacities, obliquities that can never be rendered in kind of pure and distinct ideas. So we admit that from the beginning. There is always something lost in translation. And we must mourn the illusion of a perfect understanding, a perfect communion of minds and accept that there's always a conflict. So when we do accept that, that we live after Babel, that we're always involved in what Derrida called a dialectic of hospitality, which is a mixture of hostility and hospitality, when we welcome the other as the stranger, how can we sort of move from thinking that dialogue is impossible, um, particularly when accentuated by the fact that the other person does not want to, enter into dialogue or be understood or be recognized um, on the one hand. And how do we move from that impossible situation to what we might call a difficult situation? Ricoeur once said that the difference between him and Derrida, between hermeneutics and deconstruction, was the difference between two words, impossible and difficult. So I want to kind of push the impossibility of dialogue towards a difficult possibility of dialogue. 
And um, so much for a few words on the philosophical, the contemporary philosophical debate on uh, dialogue as possible or impossible translation, as an ethic of possible or impossible hospitality to the stranger, to the other, as guest or enemy. To, um, I, I would like to add to that an empirical observation that we live in a time where we are surrounded by examples, and I'm sure you've probably discussed it already in your series, of the dialogue des sourds, as the French call it, the dialogue of the deaf, where people are not talking to each other, or if they do talk, they do not understand each other. There is far more misverständnis than verständnis out there. Some obvious examples, um, try talking to the anti-vaxxers. I have two um, in-laws that are anti-vax. Um, not like most American uh, anti-vaxxers here in, I'm, I'm speaking from Boston, who are generally followers of, of Trump on the right wing, but uh, they are left-wing anti-vaxxers. But it doesn't really matter uh, that much whether you're coming from one ideology or another. We all probably have examples in our family and friends and relatives and communities of people who simply do not accept that vaccination is a good thing. How do you get through to these people? How do you get through indeed to people who are anti-democracy? I mean, take the majority of the Republicans in, in, in North America today, who actually still believe that Biden was not officially uh, elected. Um, and the subversion of democracy goes on daily. How do you talk to the followers of, 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 of Donald Trump? How do you talk to Mr. Putin and his followers at the moment as he threatens to invade Ukraine? What can be said? Uh, how at a broader level you talk to the climate deniers, the deniers of scientific fact, as in vaccination, we have it on the climate too. How do you talk to these people? And yet if we don't, a good percentage of the contemporary human community is not engaged in the pursuit of what we might call a common interest in, in truth and climate justice. We have even more extreme examples when it comes to things like the Holocaust denial, the denial of the Armenian uh, genocide, uh, the Rwandan gen genocide, even in Northern Ireland at a, more, at a smaller scale, but it matters. Uh, the numbers are fewer, but Bloody Sunday was recently commemorated. And uh, you know, where 14 innocent people were shot dead. And for 30 years, the British government and army uh, and, and political community, official communi political community, denied uh, the facts. Uh, and that led to huge hurt and so on. But eventually, with David Cameron, and, and now more officially since then, uh, there has been something of an apology uh, for covering up the truth. So it can happen in certain instances. And in, in uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Tribunals in South Africa, I'm sure you've probably touched on this too in your, in your discussions, what seemed impossible that, that the proponents of apartheid would actually sit down and admit that they had tortured and raped and exterminated uh, and executed um, members of the black community. But it happened. So there are little miracles, there are, instances where the impossible becomes possible and where a, a Nelson Mandela can actually shake hands with a de Klerk or, 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 or John Hume can shake hands with Ian Paisley um, or Sadat can shake hands with Begin or Gandhi can shake hands with Mountbatten. It has happened. There are instances of it. So what I want to do in my remaining time is to give some examples um, from Guestbook, uh, this international nonprofit which I direct and, and uh, working with a, with a community of partners in different parts of, of, of the globe. Um, we work basically with, in divided communities, encouraging young people to tell the story of their woundedness, uh, the woundedness of their community in historic conflict with a, an advers adversarial community and then to listen to that of their enemy, and then to come up with a third 
narrative, uh, turning history into story, so to speak. The word for history and story in most in most languages and cultures is 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 the same. Geschichte in German, um, histoire in French. Je raconte moi une histoire, or je vais faire de l'histoire. So there is that ambiguity between telling it as it happened and telling it as if it happened like this or that, where we combine uh, in a good history, in a good testimony, a fidelity to what actually happened. As Paul Ricard says, we've got to count the cadavers if we're talking, say, about Holocaust testimonies. And at the same time, we've got to tell a story that will strike people as important, where they will actually hear that story, hear those facts recounted in a way that their imaginations can actually identify with the victims, that they can share the heart, where, where we all become, as was said in 1968, des juifs allemands. Uh, and, and, and that helps us at least to engage in a quasi-universal sharing of, of suffering across borders and boundaries and differences. So that's what the guest book is trying to uh, work towards. And I would like to give some concrete examples, very simple examples, of how these rival stories were recounted by two opposing interlocutors in a dialogue uh, where it seemed impossible at the beginning, but something happened. Uh, and uh, they created some kind of a third gesture or symbol or story, uh, which enabled something else to begin. So I'll, I'll sort of conclude the second part of my introductory remarks by giving uh, some examples of this, bearing in mind a quote from, from Paul Ricoeur, when it comes to, to dialogue, he says, to communicate at the level of the work of translation in an ethic of hospitality towards the narrative of, of the other, of the enemy. Um, we have to combine the art of linguistic hospitality with a call to take responsibility for the story of the other through the life narratives which concern that other. Ricoeur makes that statement in, in a wonderful little essay uh, written in, well, end of, the, end of the last century, published in English in 2004, called Reflections for an Ethos for a, U, a New Europe, where he basically says Europe cannot come together as a community a European community, if it doesn't share uh, the stories of the multiplicity of communities that compose it. And that means not just sharing in the official histories and stories, um, because one person's sense of triumph and identity and glory is another person's story of defeat. We've also got to exchange the stories of wounds, the stories of uh, hatred, the stories of violence. Um, and it's only when we do that, uh, which seems on the face of it impossible, that we can actually move towards a new sense of commitment uh, to uh, each other in the plurality of narratives that makes up uh, any community, including the European community. So with that as my sort of background um, philosophical uh, manifesto, um, I, I will now offer some examples. First example. These are all, by the way, available for anybody who's interested on the Guestbook uh, Project um, site, guestbookproject.org. I'm sure Gonzalo will, will send you the link and you can look them up under media exchanging, exchanging uh, stories. So let me give you a few examples. One was, one of the earliest, was that in Northern Ireland where uh, two, two young, young women, uh, school children, a secondary school in Derry, stroke, London Derry, Catholic nationalists call it Derry from the Gaelic Dira, which means um, an oak grove. Um, the Protestant loyalist unionist community, on the other hand, who live inside the walls, the Catholic live, Catholics live outside of the walls to which they were expelled 300 years ago. Um, within the walls, Protestant unionist community uh, call the city London Derry. So you've got two names, two communities, two architectures inside the, the walls, outside the walls, um, and two very different rival competing histories. So what they did was they started by, by telling each other their story, while the walls of Derry for the Protestant unionist community was a safeguard of the Bill of, 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 of Civic Rights 
they were standing up for liberty and equality against the Roman papist backward reactionary church and the native superstitious Gaelic people of Ireland. The, the, the Catholic girl uh, told her story from her point of view, the story of oppression, dispossession, disinheritance, uh, her religion was was um, was oppressed. Her language was exterminated. Her identity was constantly challenged, and so on. So they told their stories, and they then exchanged uniforms. Because in 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 Northern Ireland to this day, eighty percent of schooling uh, prior to university is still denomination denomin, denominationally segregated. So and they wear different uniforms. So. The Catholic girl puts on the Protestant girl's uniform and vice versa, and they go into each other's schools. And so what it was like to be the other and live the, the story, the identity, uh, the, 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 the community of the other. And when they did that, they met and they made a video together, um, which is full of humor, which is full of play. And uh, in so doing, they decided they made a little declaration. Uh, you know, they, they did this with their amateur cameras and so on, but they made a declaration that in future in Northern Ireland, no child should go to school that doesn't sit beside somebody uh, from, the other, from the other religion, from the other community. The first day in school, you sit beside somebody from the other community. And that sort of declaration of, if you will, impossible solidarity across the walls, across the frontiers, across the borders, um, was very effective and they became sort of peace ambassadors. They were only 15, 16 years old who went around schools in Northern Ireland and south of the border in Southern Ireland, uh, telling their story and showing their video, which was then taken up by the Guardian and the Times, uh, the Irish Times, the, the London Times, and it sort of went viral. So something very small, two 15 year old girls, some of you may have seen this TV series, Derry Girls, well, they're just like the girls in that series, um, got together, told their story, beginning with enmity, beginning with, I've never met a Protestant girl before. I've never, we, they went on holidays in different places, went to separate cinemas, separate schools, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly exchanging uniforms, exchanging stories, they suddenly were able to review their histories and come up with a new story, a third story. So that's one example. And I just like to note that the element of humor and play, if you get to see that little film, it's only about 10 minutes, uh, you, you will maybe note where they break into laughter. And one of the points I'm sort of making um, is that sometimes humor and play are absolutely essential in breaking what might seem to be a, a logically impossible, mutually exclusive sort of um, uh, traffic jam where nobody's budging, nobody's moving, and suddenly something happens and it opens up, at least for a moment. But in that moment, there can be play or laughter. I think indeed here um, of, to give a biblical example of, um, the, the, the word Isaac, which means laughter in Hebrew. And Sarah and Abraham decided to call their impossible son because he was 300 and she was barren. They couldn't have a child. And the three strangers came from outside. Instead of slaughtering and fighting with the strangers, they gave them food. And then the strangers became the harbingers of the annunciation of an impossible child, Isaac. And uh, when Sarah heard that the strangers would return in 10 months and she would be with the child, she laughed. And hence the child was called Isaac. So the beginning, the inaugural moment of most wisdom traditions, and I, I talk about this in, 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 in another book, in Anatheism and in Radical Hospitality, in almost all wisdom traditions, the inaugural moment is uh, welcoming the stranger and turning impossible hospitality into possible, turn possible hospitality, turning hostility into hospitality, the hostess as enemy, adversary, threat, monster into the friend. You find it in Greek culture too. Um, uh, Simon Vai has a beautiful commentary on Homer's Iliad, just called the Iliad, where she says the most important moment is when the ethic of hospitality breaks through the culture of revenge and warfare, 
when uh, Glaucon and Daimonides from two different tribes come together or about to repeat the cycle of violence, but instead decide to throw away their spears and shake hands. And in that moment, civilization begins. There's a trev, there's a gap, there's a truce in the war for a moment of impossible hospitality to break through. In any case, one or two other examples before we get to question and answer, which is really what I'm most interested in here is listening from you and then engaging in, in dialogue. Um, a second example is that between, uh, again, a guest book example, a Japanese youth and a Korean youth. And there are islands called the Dotgo Islands that, that lie more or less halfway between Japan and Korea, who are historic enemies going back centuries. And, and, and these islands are disputed to this day, a bit like Gibraltar in you know, your part of the country or Northern Ireland in my part of the country um, uh, when I'm in Ireland. But um, in any case, uh, the, the Dodco Islands um, have been disputed. And so the Japanese girl gave her history, official history, the Japanese official history as to why that belongs to the Japanese. It's written 500 years ago in documents. You can see there, this is Japanese, et cetera, et cetera, part of our sovereign, sovereign um, national territory. The Korean told the story from his point of view. And it, they were at loggerheads. And there was a split screen. They made, they, they made a video, and they were doing this on their iPhones. And they were literally at loggerheads. No possibility uh, of coming together. And then they decided to make a comic strip video where they became characters in this dance, this kind of comic crazy dance to a Lady Gaga song, um, where they start fighting each other and punching each other as in a sort of a Spider-Man cartoon. And then these characters, these animated characters bearing their faces um, suddenly start to move from a violent aggression uh, and combat to a dance. Um, and at the end of the video, you just see birds where, because there are 42 endangered species of birds in the Dotco Islands, it's an extraordinary fact, ecological fact. And they make a proposal uh, that the Dotco Islands be declared by both Korea, so South Korea and Japan, as a deterritorialized neutral zone. Uh, which would be uh, a breeding ground for as a bird sanctuary. Now that hasn't happened, but it was this kind of gesture of imaginary hope uh, for an aspirational hope for a situation where ecologically birds could live because there would be no military confrontation. Again, the third story was what broke the ice. It was when they started to laugh and play through the detour of a narrative uh, film um, that gave them a certain distance from themselves. And just in parenthesis, before I give another example, uh, I'm reminded of um, a woman I met in, I think it was 19, whatever, 99. I was giving a talk at McGill University in, in Canada, Montreal, on uh, the Shoah and different cinematic representations of the Shoah. So the two main examples I was analyzing I'm sure most of you are familiar with them, are the, the um, Schindler's List by Spielberg that was seen by millions of people all over the world, but sort of a Hollywood version of, of, of a Holocaust story versus Claude Lanzmann's eight, year, eight hour, almost at eight year, because it seems like that when you watch it, it is unremitting you know, first person um, witness testimonials, eight hours long, black and white very often, uh, uncompromising, no fictional characters, as he puts it, no catharsis, no kitsch, just this is what happened, this is how it happened, and we must tell it as it happened. So anyway, I was comparing and contrasting the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of telling the Holocaust um, event as either story or history or both. And suddenly at the end of it, after QA, this little old woman came down and she came up to me and she said, you know, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm one of Schindler's List. And I was on that train that left Treblinka and I survived and I ended up in Montreal and I never told anybody about it. Not my husband, not my children, not my rabbi, not my doctor, not my psychiatrist, nobody, nobody, until I saw Schindler's List. And when I saw myself being played by a fictional character bearing my name, living in that concentration camp, 
um, getting on that train, I suddenly was able to identify with myself again, my lost self, my repressed self, my traumatized self that had become totally, totally alien to me. And suddenly through the detour of fiction and play, if you will, and imagination, I was able to, what Aristotle would call, experience a, a poetic catharsis of pity and fear. Um, but it has to be through, as Aristotle rightly noted, um, plot, uh, mythos mimesis, he calls it in Greek, um, an unplotted imitation, whereby we can identify with others or with ourselves in that instance, in a way that we can't in real life. So there's something about making a movie, making a play that enables you to survive your own survival. Helen Bamber, in a book called The Good Listener, she was one of the first people, uh, counselors into um, Dachau after the liberation and became subsequently one of the founders of Amnesty International. But she noted when she went into the concentration camps, there were emaciated bodies lying around, sitting in bunks who would not move. They were told, you're free now, you can go. They would not move. Uh, they were paralyzed. And she noted how in time they had a need to tell a story, even though, as she put it, it came out like vomit. The words would just you know, rush out of their mouths eventually. And then they would create little plays together of how they were originally captured, separated from their loved ones, and brought to the concentration camp. They were very crude plays, very you know, basic rudimentary representations, but somehow by playing themselves in each other in some narrative form, some imitated form, they were able to survive their own survival. So what I'm basically saying is, even in the most impossible of situations where there seems to be no possibility of speech, no possibility of a shared world, and of course for Hannah Arendt, speaking is the creation of a third world. Narrating your world is offering it for a common sharing with, with others, including your enemies. You move from Zoe, sort of basic bear life, to bios, to, to a narrated human life. Um, so this is, this is the aim of, of art, if you will. And in a very simple way, what we're trying to do in Guestbook, where we offer you know, an invitation to people to use their iPhones. Uh, they don't need big, sophisticated and expensive cameras and lighting, everything. Just you can do your iPhones now and uh, create these stories with their, uh, with their enemies. So um, I think time is coming pretty close now to 30 minutes. So let me just maybe end with one or two quick examples. Okay, one more example is from Croatia, where a Serb and a Croat got together. They'd been at school uh, in Vukovar, before the war, when the war came, uh, there was an absolute uh, purging of one of the communities. Uh, and so, you know, 30 years on after the Balkans war, these two came, not 30 years, maybe 10, they got together. They were now university students and they tried to meet in the same room, right? They'd been at primary school together, but they'd never met since. And they tried to meet in the same room, but there was so much pressure being put on by their respective communities. Don't talk to the enemy. And they knew that if they did, it would also be on YouTube and on guestbook website. So there was too much pressure to actually appear together and meet each other, you know, after I think 15 years since they were in primary school. They were now in their early 20s and so on. And um, so they didn't meet in person. They met on camera. They met virtually like we're doing now. And for all the faults of the virtual um, as it's been imposed on us all through COVID, uh, there are some advantages. Uh, we can communicate in this way now, of course, um, but also there's a certain distanciation that, that that video allows. You don't actually have to be in the same room as somebody, which would be considered too much of a betrayal and a compromise to the enemy, but you can be there while not being there. And uh, they were able to tell their respective stories to each other and to a larger community by creating this video together. Uh, the role of symbols and metaphors in, in, in the creation of that and of that exchange is also important, but I don't have time to, to go into that. I'll, I'll, I'll end with a, a final example. Um, yeah, of the Armenian genocide. I'll end with this. So I got together an Armenian student 
and a um, Turkish student, brought them to my house here in Boston. They were students in two different universities here in Boston. The Armenian had never met a Turk. The Turk had never met an Armenian. Didn't speak each other's languages, um, had a horror of, of, of each other in many respects because of their official histories. As you probably know, in Turkey, you know, growing up, the official curriculum does not admit you know, the, 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 the fact of an Armenian genocide. So long story short, they didn't want to come into the same room. They didn't want to sit at the same table. They didn't want to share a glass of wine. They didn't want to share food. Uh, we said, well, what about this song that's sung by Croats at one side of the mountain and, and Serbs at the other, but the Battle of Kosovo? No, they didn't want to have anything to do with that. But they started, they did agree to listen to each other. So the, 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 the Turk began to tell his side of the story, how growing up, you know, he'd always, he'd never heard anything about the Armenian genocide. The only thing he knew about Armenians was the word Armenian, which was the, the, the most foul and cruel curse word you could use of anybody. The worst four letter word in the Turkish language for him growing up was Armenian. But he never, he never understood why, because the Armenian genocide was never talked about. Um, he subsequently dis discovered it when he came to America and was studying in MIT and Harvard. She had grown up in exile. Her parents and grandparents had never talked about the Armenian genocide for other reasons, not to deny it because it was too shameful as a crime, but because it was too hurtful. So like the woman who escaped in Schindler's List and got to Montreal, she never mentioned anything because it's too hurtful, it's too painful to admit into language, into a talking cure, into a narrative. So silence. But she heard the word Turk coming up as a curse word. So what they both discovered in this moment of sort of alleluia <laughs> uh, recognition was that the worst word in their respective languages for each other was a hidden word, a coded word, a word that held in silence a whole history. And when they discovered this extraordinary coincidence, they laughed. And as a result of that, the ice melted and they then went on to create a video and to form an Armenian commemoration youth society. So things can happen, little breakthroughs, but for every breakthrough in our guest book exchanges, there were 20 failures. And one just had to accept that, that the failures are to be expected. Dialogue is between enemies virtually impossible, but sometimes there is a breakthrough. And very often it is when one passes from, through language, but beyond language to some form of play, some form of art, some form of gesture, uh, an embodied gesture that uh, breaks the stranglehold, breaks the paralysis. And I'm observing that. I don't have a philosophical theory about why that works, but sometimes it works for that reason. Just as sometimes you've got to stop speaking, although speaking is essential, and extend your hand to the enemy. Um, and I'll end with a little story from Northern, from Ireland, where, you know, in 1492, there was a famous uh, scene uh, in Dublin Castle, uh, sorry, Dublin Cathedral, where the Fitzgeralds and the Ormonds had been fighting this feud for, for decades, for, you know, over a century. And it was a bloodlust uh, revenge cycle. Eventually, the Ormonds were cornered uh, and, and besieged in Dublin Cathedral, center of Dublin, and Lord Fitzgerald um, came and he knocked at the door and he said, I am going to remove my armor and bear my arm. And if you cut a hole in the door, I will extend my arm, my bare arm through that hole. You can either cut my arm off and the war continues, or you can shake my hand and the war ends. He did exactly that. Lord Ormond shook his hand um, and the war ended. And to this day in Ireland, and I think more commonly in the English language, there is a phrase that's called chancing your arm. To chance your arm is to risk your arm for the sake of something impossible. That if you extend the most vulnerable part of yourself, and laughter is 
you know, humor is humility, humus. It's our common humanity. It's our common humiliation, if you will. Um, we share our most basic humanity at that level. And in extending a bare arm, uh, you risk that fragility and humanity and um, uh, vulnerability. And uh, you may lose your life or you may gain peace. But sometimes it comes to a simple gesture like that, moving from text to action and being prepared to win or to lose. So I'll end it there. I think I've gone on for over 30 minutes. Uh, forgive me and look forward to question and answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for this superb talk, uh, as always. Uh, so let me just uh, remind the public that uh, basically you will have now more or less 45 minutes for questions and answers. And that there's there are three three ways in which you can ask your question because we have the Zoom session here, and so you can just write your uh, question on the chat if you want to. Uh, also, um, for the people in the Zoom session, you can just raise your hand or or something like that if you want to to ask a question. Um, and for the people watching on, on YouTube, you can also uh, put your question on, on YouTube if you want to. In terms of linguistic hospitality, I, I would say that if you want, uh, you can put your questions in French, for instance, because Richard understands French very well. And, and also eventually in Portuguese. If, for instance, you want to write your, your question in Portuguese in the chat or YouTube, we can translate them for Richard to, to answer it, uh, no worries. So I, I know we already have one question, at least uh, on the YouTube. I, I'll ask you if, okay. So two questions um, uh, here on the Zoom session. So I, I, I'll maybe pass on the word to, to people who raise their hands. And then uh, three questions actually. And then um, I'm, I'm also uh, giving the word to my colleagues Pedro Pereira and, and Ana Sanchez, who are co-hosting the, 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 the session with me. And we also feel some questions coming either from the Zoom chat or YouTube. So the first person who, who raised their hand was uh, Dr. André David. André, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gonçal. Um, Richard, thank you, thank you very much for this perspective. It very clearly works on an individual basis, on the one-to-one. -one. And I think that that's a very interesting point because sometimes when we have groups, it becomes very hard to knead them together and somehow mix them together. Um, could, you, could you comment on that aspect of more than one-to-one? -one? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. Um, I think it, it is easier one-to-one, -one, just as like therapy is easier one-to-one. -one. But the, the, the ones in question are not speaking as individuals, right? They're speaking, of course, for their community. They're speaking in the we. And I think if it's easier to start on a one-to-one, -one, um, because it's more practicable and it's more effective and it's more feasible, the, the next step is definitely to move to community as soon as possible. In other words, the two girls in Derry, London Derry, exchanged their stories, but then they went into each other's communities. The I became the we. The I spoke for a we and then exchanged its identity with the we. So you can't separate the individual from, from the we. Um, and in fact, in the, in the Northern Ireland one, the, the final sequence is not just between two, it's actually between four. <laughs> and the, the, the implication is, and the four extends to, to eight and the eight to 16 and so on. So it's kind of an exponential growth outwards. Um, groups, uh, we've done one or two attempts at group exchange. It, 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 it is not as effective. So I think you're actually, you know, just sociologically and phenomenologically correct about that. Um, but the aim would be definitely to try and combine the two as much as possible. And of course, as soon as you're dealing in video, you, you have a communal audience, right? It's not just an isolated meeting of Abraham and God on a mountain and, you know, nobody hears about it again. The dialogue is actually recorded and is consciously recorded in a way that not only speaks for the respective communities, but then is witnessed by the, respect, by the, 
uh, respective communities. So the, the fact that these are videos, we work in video storytelling, digital storytelling guarantees a community from the beginning. But, you know, I do know, for example, in Northern Ireland, and it's true of Africa too, you know, they used to, in, in Northern Ireland, b b fly out, you know, kids from Belfast, from West Belfast and East Belfast and bring them to Boston or bring them to New York and in a different setting. And in that setting, you know, whatever 10 or 20 Catholic kids and 10 or 20 Protestant unions kids would come together and would exchange stories. So it has been done, but um, it hasn't been the model that we've operated with because we're operating with a tiny budget to actually do that at a collective level is, is more important if you're transplanting them at any rate, just logistically, whereas it's a very simple model, digital storytelling between two people who represent their communities. But anyway, thank you for the question. And I acknowledge the, 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 the difficulty of working with groups, but that, that ultimately is the, is the aim, the target audience. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Richard. Um, so now the next question is by Professor Manuela Chaves. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm from the science world, but mm -hmm. I, I was uh, a very, I, I, I loved your your talk was really very fantastic, and um, uh, I was uh, thinking on my own story, and uh, I, I think that what you you say about humor in the relationship between people uh, are very important. Uh, I I would like to to know if is there already any hints about. Uh, which characteristics of the personality of each individual uh, could turn more easy the people to to be open to, to the others? Uh, I haven't quite understood the question. Could could you repeat it? Which which feature yeah. apart from humor is it? Or yeah, uh, the uh, the pers uh, personality, the 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 type of, of people um, is it. Uh, uh, so, is there any people who are uh, more able to 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 mm. be open to the others? Uh, is that uh, uh, is that mm. uh, something which is known? Um, good question. It's not something we've done sort of statistical analysis or, or, or research on, but I would say anybody you know with imagination is capable of of empathy, or to put it in less sort of benevolent terms, is capable of dark humor. If you look at the sort of some of the best, um, most therapeutic accounts of unmentionable crimes, they're very often done with a dark humor. Think of, you know, the producers. So you've got a, a Jewish uh, writer, director, producer, who tells the story of the Jews in the Holocaust, right? Um, You've got comic strips mouse, you know, representing the Germans and the Jews, again, told from a Jewish point of view. And there is something about dark humor, and I'm really taking the kind of extreme cases of Holocaust and so on. You find it very often in Northern Ireland. Um, Derry Girls being a being a, a modern sitcom that's had a huge um, success in the English speaking world. I don't know whether it's found its way to, to Lisbon, but there all the taboos that led to 30 years of warfare and people killing each other in each other's houses and streets, um, suddenly through this comic portrayal uh, of each other, it, it has le led to the breaking of the taboo. So I think anybody who's capable of imagining and anybody who's capable of laughing and playing, um, more than you know, having a PhD in philosophy and being able to, ex being able to engage in perfectly uh, clear and distinct propositional arguments, like Habermas might say, you know, for a post-nationalist constellation in Europe, I'm all for it, I'm with him. But his, his invitation is, and, and everybody is welcome to enter into this sort of ethic of normative discourse, where you leave aside all your differences and your strangeness and your your religion, your, your particular whatever tribal 
uh, characteristics um, and enter into this enlightenment discourse of pure, transparent, shared consciousness. And that's just not going to happen for most people. It's too much of a leap, you know, and they don't all have PhDs in Habermasian communication discourse, admirable as it as it is. You know, we have to acknowledge that when when you're faced with somebody and you're trying to translate them and vice versa, there's a double injunction. Translate me, but don't translate me. You know, accept me as a guest, but don't ask me to become the same as you. Allow me to be different. Um, Fanny, how the poet has a great line where she says, the guest must leave the host sometimes in order to remain a guest. That it's important to acknowledge when you're dealing with the enemy that there is something irreducibly different, strange and untranslatable about them. And sometimes when that happens, we reach the limits of reason, not to embrace irrationalism, but to acknowledge a certain playful humor. And that seems very difficult when we're dealing with taboo subjects, but it's actually when we're dealing with taboo subjects that it's the most important. So I would say, yeah, humor. And that means acknowledging our vulnerability, our humanity, our humus, you know. Um, and people who acknowledge their wounds are much more likely to enter into conversation with somebody else than people who don't acknowledge them and who act them out, so to speak, which is totally understandable because we repress our wounds and our vulnerabilities. But if we're in a situation where we can share our wounds, then we can become wounded healers. Um, but anyway, thank you for an excellent question. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, I suggest that we go to the, the next person who has raised their hand for long, which is uh, Bettina Langa, and then we'll, we'll move briefly to, to, to YouTube and also the chat because some people have uh, put their questions a long time ago, uh, and, and then the next one. Okay, so Bettina, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, <laughs> I'm actually using um, sort of not not so much Habermas. It's more Rawls and Kantian thought mm. experiments right. in, my, in my PhD. So <laughs> I, I haven't given up hope on that. Uh, but, Good um, for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I was actually I found it fascinating to to listen to you. Um, what I was just and in fact, one of the reasons I came on to this talk is that I, I did read, um, you know, some of your work quite a long time ago. And I thought, well, I must I must actually meet the person, as it were. <laughs> uh, um, I was just wondering, because you gave some examples at the beginning, um, when you talked about the dialogue of the deaf, uh, mm -hmm. and you mentioned followers of Trump, um, anti-vaxxers, and, and so on. Mm. Um, and I'm just wondering... It seems to me that the, these examples may be quite different from the examples you then gave from the guestbook project. So it seems to me the examples from the guestbook project, maybe they were just those examples you mentioned, are about past atrocities or past injustices um, and perhaps their current consequences. So in Northern Ireland, for example, it would be more the current consequences, I guess. Um, so... <laughs> The, the, the dialogue was, would respond to a situation in which, in one version of history at least, a certain side, one, was able to impose all sorts of injustice um, on the other. Whereas if we take Trump followers or anti-vaxxers, it seems to me they are mobilizing, they're campaigning for victory. And they believe that if they just do enough, they will win and they will the anti-vaxxers will persuade the rest of the population open their eyes and they will come over to them mm. so i think they, they're in quite a different place whereas you know young people growing up in northern ireland well they didn't create or you know even their parents created the situation mm. they find themselves in whereas the anti-vaxxers are actively campaigning to <clears throat> to win mm. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And first of all, let me comment on Kant and say I, I, I wouldn't give up on Kant either. Um, and, you know, he has, as you well know in your research, this, uh, this wonderful um, invocation of representative thinking, which is a form of imaginative thinking where aesthetically, with an aesthetic reflective judgment, we can actually um, lead to a moral sensibility where we take in as many different points of view as possible, opposing points of view as possible. Um, and I think that Kant of the third critique is 
is very much part of, you know, what Ricoeur is talking about when he talks about narrative understanding. In fact, he quotes Kant uh, and on the aesthetic reflective judgment and representative thinking and imagination as one of his uh, representatives. So maybe I was a bit hard on Habermas, but certainly, certainly Kant is very, very open to that, that fundamental role of imagination. Um, uh, in bringing about a moral consensus and, and, and common understanding. But to, to your other point about, yeah, the, the power, and of course there, there is questions of power and permission to narrate in all narrative exchanges and all dialogues. So that's very important to bear in mind. The only thing I would say about, about the Trumpers and the anti-vaxxers, at, at least in this part of the world, is, is something like this. They, if you talk to them, they actually think they're the minority that they're overpowered by, you know, um, big pharma and big government and the liberal media and the liberal consensus. And they're the little people that have not been heard until Mr. Trump comes along, who is Lord of Misrule and kind of represents their repressed unconscious. And so they say, you know, law and majority rule and the liberal post-enlightenment consensus has done us no good, but maybe this maverick will represent our point of view. And I mean, I'm sure there were many Germans in Barmore, Germany, who, who felt the same thing, you know, about, you know, we're the defeated ones, the, uh, the, the, the forgotten ones, the disinherited, and this little yeah. man Hitler is going to speak for us, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is an interesting sort of reversal that what comes across as a language of power and arrogance very often masks a sense of being humiliated and mm -hmm. voiceless. And yeah, one of the guest book um, examples, and we have several, they're not all about, you know, dramatic conflict zones. The examples I gave are, but I mean, there's one, you know, Boston student who, who goes to Appalachia and she talks to uh, a Trump supporter in a mining town, uh, you know, a disaffected uh, mining town, abandoned mining town. And he says, I'm voting for Trump because you know, nobody else uh, will bring back my job. And, you know, I'm forgotten. I, I'm, the, I'm the lonely one. You know, you all live in cities and you have access to all these, these wonderful, you know, contemporary um, services and jobs and culture and everything else. I have nothing. So that's why I am voting for Mr. Trump. Um, and I would just say about Northern Ireland, it's an extraordinary paradox, you know, that both communities in Northern Ireland think they're victims. <laughs> yeah. they, they both have a besieged mentality. I mean, the, the Catholics, because clearly in Northern Ireland, through gerrymandering and, you know, suppression of the vote and, and, and access to education for decades, they were, um, they were very oppressed. But if you talk to the unionists, they'll say, OK, well, they're the minority in our province of Ulster. But we're a minority on the island of Ireland, and we need somebody to protect us from the big, dangerous Catholic nationalist majority that's about to invade us. So very often you find, you know, when you look at the wounds of people, that there are actually communalities. And one little story that I tell in Radical Hospitality, just while I'm on Northern Ireland, I'll go through this very quickly because I realize there's different, lots of people coming, trying to get in. But I was chairing a meeting of ex-paramilitary prisoners, Protestant and Catholic and they'd just been released from prison. And one guy, a Catholic IRA, Irish Republican Army, um, paramilitary, told the story of how one night he was in bed and there was a knock at the door and, and, and suddenly people broke in, gagged him, bound him, bundled him into the back of a van, brought him to a barn outside of Derry, tied him to a chair and put a gun to his head. And he was about to be executed. And before he was shot, he said to his executioner, can I smoke a cigarette? Can I smoke a last cigarette? So the next thing he realized, he had a cigarette in his hand and he started smoking a cigarette. And as he was smoking his last cigarette, he told the story of why he joined the IRA. And he said, you know, I joined the IRA and I did plant bombs and I did kill people because my grandfather was taken prisoner by the B specials and was beaten to death. My father was kneecapped and uh, left lame and was unemployed. My mother um, became a uh, depressive and committed suicide. And he went through three generations of the most appalling personal injuries, communal and personal. And he said, that's why, uh, that's why I joined the IRA. Uh, you know, he, he took a long, as long as he could to smoke a cigarette. So he would survive that long. 
But anyway, he, he finished the story and he waited for the gun to go off. He was still blindfolded and there was no gun. He waited for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Eventually, he managed to free himself and walked home. And as he finished his story, a guy stood up at the back of the room and he said, uh, I'm a loyalist and, uh, you know, I was in the UVF and I was the one who had the gun to your head, but I didn't shoot you because when I heard your story, I realized it was my story. So, in fact, they both had stories about, you know, transgenerational grievance and hurt and suffering. And it was in realizing that they both had the same story. I mean, radically different, but you know, ultimately the same story of victimhood and suffering that they were able to make peace. And they actually joined then a small ex-paramilitary group of prisoners um, from the loyalist and, and nationalist communities to try and work on themes of, of dialogue. So anyway, that's a long way of answering your great question and good luck with Kant. <laughs> and the research. Uh, so uh, now uh, I'm going to give the word to my colleague Pedro Matos Pereira, who, as you know, co-hosts uh, the cycle with me with, uh, in the Nascentia. So he's going to field uh, the questions coming from, from YouTube. Pedro. Thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you, Richard, for a fantastic session. So we have uh, three people actually wanting to understand more about one particular subject, which is very timely, which is how do you talk to people that actually do not want to talk to you? How do you avoid them shutting down or uh, not, what, not wanting to, to hear you? Mm -hmm. And also a uh, follow-up question that uh, once it's curious, it's a person else that's curious to understand <clears throat> how the guest put project has uh, made people that are in those extreme, highly ex extreme positions come together and examples of what these people have done, what these persons have done. Thank you. Okay. What do you do when there um, is someone who doesn't want to talk to you? Well, first of all, you've got to um, acknowledge that they don't want to talk to you and respect that. Um, and maybe keep knocking at the door, you know, uh, keep inviting them, but also accepting their right to say no. And it may come to a point where you stop trying to talk and you walk. Basically, you smoke a cigarette, you go for a walk, you do something, you play. You know, there's a famous story of Freud and trauma. How do you deal with trauma? And he gives the example of his grandson, little Ernst, who he's babysitting. And the Leinster is collapsing, you know, in hysterical tears because his mother is gone and Freud is left to babysit. And he watches his little son who eventually um, uh, takes a spool of wool and plays with it, where it, it, it casts this spool of cotton away and then pulls it back, imitating the coming and going of the mother. In other words, sometimes when you're faced with trauma, it's by doing something. He also utters the word for da, gone back again. My mother is gone. My mother's coming back again which were its first words. And that gave, by doing something in some sort of, by enacting something, doing something, rather than trying to solve it at a verbal level of talk, um, is sometimes the way, the way to go. When, when words break down and conversation is impossible, it may be a, an opportunity to try and do something. I mean, if you look at, you know, in a Pakistani earthquake where the Muslims and the Hindus and the Christians are all digging their children out of the same pit because it matters more than their differences that the suffering of their children needs to be alleviated. They need to rescue their children. So, I mean, maybe, you know, the pandemic, the global, the climate crisis may galvanize our attentions about acting in common that then can lead by example. You shall know them by their fruits, as the gospels say, you know, not by their words, but by their fruits. So, you know, maybe sometimes conversation is impossible, but action may not be. Now that's a gesture towards hope, um, but 
it's it's a partial answer to your question. There was a second part that I don't think I addressed. It was that? basically yes. You you would, I think you addressed the question of uh, uh, that uh, these participants were curious about. But there was a follow up question regarding oh. uh, pr uh, actual examples, like you gave uh, several oh. examples on the guest book. But in this specific case of people that was so far apart, that's I think the what Elsa is trying to get is. It's hard to grasp how two people that are so far, far apart can come together, like the example you gave of the Trump supporter. But um, how? what did, did, did those people do after? Did they, they came together and what did they build on that, on that new, well, newly they, found they, conversation? In, in, in the examples I'm giving, they all made videos that then go on the website, that then are shared with other groups who invite them to give talks and so on. But they become in, in their ways, little mini peace ambassadors. But even if they don't, some instances it's far less dramatic and they just uh, live a more amplified life. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. But it's not like I'm giving soft examples, you know, for survivors of the Palestinian Israeli war or Northern Ireland war. I mean, these are cruel wars. Uh, the Holocaust is a cruel war. Croatia was a cruel war. The Balkans, I mean, these are not just people who have a, a, a minor political difference um, over whether they vote for Trump or not. These are people who have lived through generations of hate. And if it's possible for them to engage in some kind of shared storytelling, then, you know, in, in, in the gesturing of a third story, then maybe it's possible for the Trumpers and the anti-Trumpers and the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers. In any case, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, I'm now uh, giving the word to Anna, Anna Sanchez, um, for the, the questions coming from, from the chat, the Zoom yeah. chat. Thank you so much, Gonçalo. So uh, let me just start by joining all the participants who have posed the questions by saying what a great uh, talk this has been and how much we, at least all these people who are, have voiced and myself, have uh, how much we have enjoyed your, your talk. And so the first question is from uh, Vasco Guerra and Vasco else actually asks, most of the examples you gave involve young people. And so if you think this is a prerequisite for this to work, and if so, if you believe there is, we have hope here from this uh, youth to go yeah. on. Well, you know, there's a great story in, in Ireland. If you want to know what happened, ask your father. If you want to know what people say happened, ask your mother. And if you want to know what will never happen, ask your grandparent. In other words, there is an element, it's kind of just common comic wisdom, that the older you get uh, without engaging in a culture of hospitality, let's say, with the enemy, the more entrenched it becomes. It's much harder to get elderly people, usually, you know, there is the, the adage of the wise old, the wise elders, but very often entrenched trauma will be stronger um, in people who are old than, I mean, I'm old, I speak as an old person, than in, uh, than in young people, simply because it's like, you know, a child is, as Chomsky points out linguistically, has this infinite competence to use language, to learn languages. And the more we grow, the more we entrenched we become in our linguistic capacities and performances. And that's true of our ideas, of our categories, of our identities. So that's why, you know, if you want to bring about change, talk with young people. It's much more likely uh, to find uh, an opening of imagination and, and, and an invitation to play. Um, and then, you know, the grandchildren will convert the grandparents. <laughs> Um, that's often the way the way it goes. But um, anyway, good question, and yeah, um, I'm answering with. And by the way, when I say the, uh, if you want to know what happened, ask your father. That's an old adage about history. I, if you want to know the facts, you ask your father. But if you want to know what what people say happened, because that's actually what affects people's lives, you ask your mother, and that's where story comes in. Of course, you've got to combine the maternal with the paternal, the history with the story. Um, but there you go. Okay, thank you. 
We have two other questions here. So uh, Dietrich Delpec asks, uh, is, how do you feel about the inter an interdisciplinary approach to projects such as the guest book? And how does, do these examples or experiences redefine philosophy as a discipline for you? Yeah, um, I'm totally for the interdisciplinary. Um, I don't think guest book could survive without the interdisciplinary. And, uh, you know, we, in addition to the digital storytelling with, with young people in divided communities, we, you know, we have multiple uh, conferences and seminars and whatnot speaker series, and they are always and invariably interdisciplinary. Um, now, I have to say, uh, they're usually between the human sciences, you know, it's probably uh, on guest book members of maybe 12 different uh, faculties, but they're, you know, the Geistwissenschaft for the most part, the human sciences. And um, at the moment, we're, 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 we're preparing a big conference called Hosting Earth about how we can, you know, host the earth as the earth hosts us, this kind of guest and host relationship with the earth. It's an eco-hospitality. But there we're engaging very much also with the Naturwissenschaften, you know, with biologists and marine biologists and um, uh, physicists, and particularly the new physics is very important in this regard. So I do think the the debate between the sciences and the arts is absolutely crucial here. And I think continental philosophy, which I hail from for the most part, has been very bad for the most part in dealing with the natural sciences. It's very good in the human sciences, you know, linguistics and structuralism, you know, anthropology, psychi psychology and so on. But when it comes to medicine or physics, there's been a resistance. You know, Heidegger sort of famously or infamously said, science doesn't think. Well, it can think and it does think, and we need that dialogue. Merleau-Ponty was, was maybe something of an exception. And you find increasingly now, I think European philosophers, Michel Serre would be another very good example, open to Julia Kristeva, a dialogue sort of between the human and the natural sciences, but yes, absolutely for interdisciplinarity, the way to go against specialization. Okay, Richard, uh, we have one last question from Anna Jesus, who says that regardless of one's position on social networks, the fact is that they do represent a large part of the interactions going on, on uh, in society nowadays. And uh, so she highlights that how often communication is uh, highly toxic with trolling and misinformation running. And, uh, uh, and citizens who might be, citizen groups which might be inorganic, get organized and just try to... to um, uh, they make dialogue increasingly difficult. And so she asks, do you think, is it truly impossible to reach out to these people in social networks? What's your experience and advice about this? My advice there is just tell better stories. You know, there's a, there's a phrase in, in, in Gaelic society, maybe I have it in Portugal too, the hair of the dog that bit you. If you drink too much whiskey, uh, when you wake up with a headache in the morning, you take a glass of whiskey. Um, it's the hair of the dog that bit you that will cure you. And beside the disease, you will find the cure very often. We know this, even the very principle of vaccination and homeopathy. You give somebody a little bit of pharmacon or poison to, to bring about a, a, an immune response. So that's a old herbalist medical wisdom, right? Going by, right back to... Um, uh, right back to Epidaurus and Chiron and, and, and so on. Um, so uh, ancient medical wisdom. But uh, leading up to today and, you know, our world of digital communications, I would say there's no point sort of, you know, banning the internet. That's not going to happen and it shouldn't happen. It's a question of just getting in there and telling better stories, you know? I mean, the next war will be fought, whether it's with Putin or whoever, um, will be fought probably on the internet, you know? I mean, perhaps it'll be fought by tanks too. God, God forbid, as we, as we speak, it could happen in Ukraine. But, but I think increasingly it's going to be cyber warfare. What um, Donald, Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of State for Bush, called PSYCHOPS, Psychological Operations. And there is the hair of the dog. You know, if the poison is coming from disinformation, misinformation, QAnon sites, uh, and so on, conspiracy sites, you got to get in there and tell a stronger story, you know? I mean, sometimes I, I despair of my Democrat liberal colleagues here in North America who don't get in and fight. You know, they, 
they complain and say, let's go to the Supreme Court. Well, you're not going to get justice there at the moment, but uh, or enough justice. But sometimes you've got to get in there and realize that the answer to a bad story is a better story. OK, thank you, Richard. Well, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think Pedro has another question from, from mm -hmm. YouTube. Yes, uh, it's a, uh, more of a curiosity about the guest book project. Mm -hmm. uh, and Elsa asks, um, how, where do you find the people that participated in this project? So volunteers, do you try to go to places and so on? Yeah, it's kind of viral and by contagion. Um, you know, we started in a university, Boston College, and then we, we operated in an inter-varsity context. Uh, universities, other universities and colleges in Boston, then New England, then North America, then South America, then Europe. And we built up partnerships in Asia and now basically we have partnerships throughout the world. But it's, it, it, it is through, it's through contagion, you know, and there's a website there and people, you know, obviously through social media, there are open invitations for hosting Earth. Now we have it out on, you know, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and whatnot, the invitations. And then people hear about it, pass it on. And that's the way contemporary communications work. I'm not great at it, but I have very good young assistants who are, and um, they get the work out. But it, it is very much a collaborative sort of testimonial, um, lateral, horizontal, you know, we don't work through any state agencies or the UN or government. Um, we work very much from the ground up and horizontally like rhizomes you know or or mushrooms you know the um, what do they call it the mycelian web that sort of you know links underground um and trees communicate through it nature communicates through it i mean that would that would be my sort of ideal model maybe also for you know transformative digital communication that it works uh, as a web you know worldwide web um, and there's one beneath our feet, which is the mycelium web, and then there's one above ground over our heads, which is the airwaves of the digital. So anyway, that's 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 how we work. One person tells another person, tells another person, and then people submit their work and we go from there. But everybody's welcome. <laughs> so if you've got an idea, write, write to us and we'll work with you. Thank you, Richard. Thank, thank, you, th thank you again, Richard. Uh, I wonder if we have uh, other questions coming in. Do you, and does anyone else want to add anything? If not, uh, I'll make one very small question myself uh, and then maybe we, we can end. So um, again, thank you very much, Richard. It has been superb dialoguing with you uh, as always. Um, I think I'm, I'm just following up on, on some of the questions about the, the I mean, populism and anti-vaxxers and, and, and all that stuff. I've, I've always I've admired, I've known and admired the Gaspel project for a, a long time, as you know, and I think I've always seen it as some sort of project of reconciliation because this impossible leap uh, from hostility to, to hospitality is really about changing people's attitudes and telling a new story together whereby the enemy ceases to be seen as an enemy and and is now someone with which with whom I can I can collaborate in um, uh, we, that becomes the guest. Uh, but I guess when we're speaking about these other sorts of um, of movements of people holding uh, extreme beliefs, etc. It's also about the possibility of changing their minds about certain facts, for instance. Uh, and so I am just wondering if a uh, guest book has some sort of, um, of model for doing that. I, I'm guessing that one of the things is practice the virtue of listening uh, to the other, just listen to what the other has to say, even if this can seem wildly delusional. And if what you've said about telling a better story is mm -hmm. actually what you can offer as a glimpse for, for instance, making someone um, leaving behind their uh, delusion about, I don't know, COVID-19 being invented by a big pharma or stuff like that. Just, mm. I don't know what you want, if you still want to add something about this. 
Yeah, I mean, you've put it pretty well there. You've you've translated uh, what Guestbook is trying to do and what I'm trying to do with Melissa Fitzpatrick and radical hospitality from thought to action. And in a way, it's it's also from text and talk to action. You see, I do think ultimately, first of all, you've got to start by recognizing the enemy as an enemy, you know, and, and not sort of wish that away. There are enemies out there who are have fundamentally opposed views and they're not going to convert, you know, overnight. So that's very important to be absolutely um, candid and courageous about acknowledging the difficulties and the limits, right? The limits, the radical limits of hospitality, which will fail at least once for every time that it succeeds, at least. But I'd say acknowledging the animosity, the real animosity of an enemy, um, without any rose-tinted glasses, uh, without any illusions, renouncing the lure of a perfect, easy translation into a common consensus, um, however much that may be desired, acknowledging one's limits. And then I think operating from wounds, you know, I, and I don't say that in any miserableist sense, but when it comes to competing stories, it's very often, coming back to an earlier question, about a claim to power, a claim to victory. We won. You know, what's the worst thing that a Trumper can call anybody? A loser, right? <laughs> because we won. Make America great again. It's about greatness, glory, triumph. Um, and that's part of human nature. It's part of the human ego, individually and community. But what if one was to attend more not to how we won, but how we've lost and how we are lost. We are all lost vis-a-vis -vis the climate um, emergency. We're all lost together. We're all in this together. We share a common woundedness because we share a common earth that is wounded. And very often, you know, if you want to really empathize with somebody, it is through woundedness, you know? There's a beautiful story told by one of my compatriots, Colin McCann, called A Paragon, where he tells how an Israeli and a Palestinian activist who both, in different ways, this true story, lost their children, lost a child each to, to terrorist violence, and how they came together out of grief. In other words, when there is a shared grief, like the story I told you about the paramilitaries in Northern Ireland, that's where you're likely to get to get some kind of breakthrough, however minimal. You know, I recognize you because you had a child that suffered. You lost a child. You know, when Dostoevsky says in The Grand Inquisitor, the one example we can all agree on is that evil is the torture of an innocent child. So there are things that are quasi-universal, right? For all our identity politics and so on, and our multiculturalism, and bring it on, you know, bring on all the multiple plural identities. But there are quasi-universal, um, transcultural phenomena and values. And one of them is a common suffering about the loss of a, of, of a loved one. And I think sometimes that's where you've got to begin, by recognition of common sufferings before you can go somewhere else. Okay, um, thank you very much, Richard. So in a nutshell, mutual recognition through shared fragility, but still with a touch of hope, hope mm. for the future and hope uh, in action. I think this was a superb talk. I think everyone agrees uh, with that too. Uh, so, um, so far, so close <laughs> to quote from, from, from a film. Uh, we're all very glad to, to have been able to, to hear you. Um, we'll keep in touch as, as always. And so as for our, our conference cycle, how to dialogue with those who refuse to listen, we'll meet again exactly one month from now, uh, March 14, uh, with Inês Narciso and Vera Nuvais to talk about the origins of, of disinformation and, and fake news. Um, thank you again on behalf of the Lisbon Academy of Sciences, the Young Scientist Seminar, uh, Pedro and, and myself. Thank you, Richard, and thank you to everyone who attended. Bye. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. <laughs>